God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations on all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Once Sojourner Truth was freed from northern enslavement, she spent a lot of time traveling, networking, and speaking about the importance of abolitionism and feminism. She spoke regularly as a preacher and teacher about the ways black people and women deserved freedom and rights in this country. In 1858, in the state of Indiana, Sojourner was speaking to a large crowd of mostly white men of the Democratic Party. Because her testimony was so powerful and indicting, many of the people in attendance became uncomfortable as a result of their participation in pro-slavery and gender discriminatory politics. Instead of interrogating their own bodily discomfort, they turned on truth and accused her of being a man. In today's world, we call that gender policing. They insinuated that because she had a deep voice, she was a counterfeit woman and demanded that she be taken to a private room with the women at that convention and bare her breasts, thereby proving her true sex. Sojourner Truth was a former slave, a preacher who wasn't educated, literate, or ordained. She was black and a woman. How could she possibly be so articulate, so powerful, so transforming and transformative on that stage? How could she possibly be a published author, a homeowner, a world-renowned speaker so full of integrity and the capacity to call people into higher dimensions of their humanity? She wasn't supposed to be all that in 1858 in this country. Her pedigree, her race, her gender, her lack of access to formal training didn't match who she had become in America during the 19th century. Instead of looking at their own nonsense notions of meritocracy, they subjected Sojourner Truth to an identity test. It conjures up questions about power, doesn't it? When someone who isn't supposed to can. When someone who isn't supposed to does and does it better than those who are supposed to. We are told, just like they were told back in Truth's day, that power comes by rank, by social class, by accomplishment, by the hallmarks of privilege, degrees, money, and political savvy networks. But Truth's life reveals the flaw in that story. Power isn't actually something you gain by having certain color skin or by what genitals you have or knowing certain people or doing certain things or owning certain stuff. True power, the kind of power that comes from and through God into us is a kind of capacity to rise, to shine, to do what hasn't been done before to do what you and you uniquely are called to do in this life. Of all of the things about Sojourner Truth that I have read during this Black History Month study that I've been taking, this story of her experience in Indiana is the most disgusting and compelling to me. The audacity of those in the audience to go at her with such hostile and barbaric treatment makes me sick. But her response just about makes me fall out with admiration, respect, and wow. In response to the refusal of the men to adjourn the meeting because they demanded a gender screening, Sojourner decided to flip the script. Nell Painter, Sojourner Truth's autobiographer, writes, she told them that her breasts had suckled many a white baby to the exclusion of her own offspring, that some of those white babies had grown to a man's estate, and that although she had suck they had suckled from her colored breasts, they were, in her estimation, far more manly than those in the audience. And she quietly 
disrobed and asked them if they wished to suck too. <laughs> that wasn't the sojourner truth you were taught about growing up, was it? We heard about the sojourner truth who said, ain't I a woman, and spoke with eloquence to white people who were Quakers and fellow abolitionists. We heard about the sojourner truth who wanted dignity and respect for all people, who loved her friend Jesus and settled in her late life in Battle Creek, Michigan. We hear very little of the sojourner truth who expected vengeance on the day of the Lord for white supremacy and those who benefited from it. We hear very little of the apocalypticism at the heart of Sojourner Truth's theology that she expected the second coming to happen in her lifetime because she couldn't fathom that the suffering of black people and women could continue any longer in this country. 1800s. We hear very little of the Sojourner Truth who forced those men to confront their own racist and sexist ideology by putting her body as a symbol in their faces and thereby taking her power back from them. Women of color have had their bodies put on display by white supremacy again and again in this country during slave auctions during severe and cruel punishment, during curated performances for slave masters in instances of fetishizing and rape, down to the way corporate-driven music television sponsors and pop star white girls use black women's bodies today to gain recognition and profit. If you look at how dress codes are enforced in public schools, it is often young girls of color who are the most carefully scrutinized and punished. This is a historical pattern. So while I find Sojourner's act of defiance quite compelling and heroic, I also want to acknowledge that I wish she'd never had to do it in the first place. And I want us to think about her as a woman who's been written out of prophetic history, because women are always written out of prophetic history. Our stories are not canonized in the Bible or anywhere else. I want us to think about her prophetic history next to the prophetic history of Isaiah and Jesus. Because it's important when we look at black history for us to do that in faith communities against the backdrop of our faith. So you saw that story a few minutes ago, right, about the prophet Amos. He was asked by Yahweh to disrobe and to wander the streets naked and barefoot for three years. I hope I never get commissioned by God to do anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> and so do you. Anyway, um, so Yahweh's point in this commissioning is to have Isaiah experience and symbolize in the flesh what was to come for the community. All right? So Yahweh is trying to tell the people of Israel that their hopes for Egypt and Ethiopia to rescue them are in vain. Because just like the prophet has endured nakedness and walking barefoot for three years, so shall the Egyptians and Ethiopians once they are captured by Assyria. So if this history confuses you, don't worry about it. That's not the point. The point is that symbolic bodily acts are at the heart of of the prophetic and Christian traditions. We look at Isaiah walking around naked, and it may strike us weird, but it wasn't out of line for a prophet's body to be the revelation of God. Prophets did that. Prophets still do that. So let me be very specific here by what I mean when I say the process of prophetic revelation. All right? There is always a medium for God's revelation. There is always a medium that makes God's word known to us. Sometimes it's direct from God to prophet and prophet to people, but a lot of the time there is a specific act or symbol or experience that God and the prophet share in order for the prophet to understand God's meaning first. All right? Before the prophet goes and shares that meaning with God's people. You with me? Okay. 
So for instance, I'm going to give you some examples of this phenomenon in the Bible. 1 Kings 11, the prophet Ahijah rips his clothing in 12 pieces in order to symbolize the tearing apart of the 12 tribes, right? In the 27th chapter of Jeremiah, the prophet is instructed by Yahweh to wear a yoke around his neck in order to symbolize the burden the Israelites will face by submitting to Babylon. In the 37th chapter of Ezekiel, the prophet is taken to the Valley of Dry Bones in order to prophesy breath back into the people. In the next chapter, Ezekiel is asked to hold two sticks in his hand that represent Judah and Israel reunited. This all happens in the midst of Israel's diaspora before the king of Persia grants people entry back to their land. All of these prophetic bodily experiences happen before the revelation of God goes viral. My point here is that the prophetic activity often includes a radical, physical, symbolic, bodily experience first. One might call that incarnation, which takes me to Jesus. The major symbol at the heart of our tradition is that of Jesus' body on the cross. That is the radical, physical, symbolic, bodily experience for Christians. And for 2,000 plus years, we have been fighting ourselves about whether Jesus wanted to be on that cross or not. There are many camps within Christianity, but there's nothing that divides us up into warring factions like soteriology, which is just a fancy word for salvation, which is just a fancy word for being saved. Most of us agree that there's something about what happened to Jesus on that cross that has to do with our salvation, but the exact details of that event and God's intentions within them aren't so easily agreed upon. Many of us claim that Jesus knew from the get-go that he would die on the cross because he was predestined to sacrifice his life for the atonement of sin. Others of us claim that Jesus knew he would die on a cross because that's what Rome did to people and that it had more to do with standing up for what's right and modeling integrity and being punished by earthly powers than any kind of fulfillment of predestined salvation. Either way, there's an agreement that Jesus made a bodily sacrifice that resulted in worldly change. What we disagree on is how much freedom or obedience how much preset plan versus spontaneity existed in the critical moments leading up to Jesus' death and what all of that has to do with God. There's something similar when I look at Sojourner Truth's radical act in Indiana in 1858. Would she have had to bear her breasts at all and thereby be subject to a historical pattern of exposing and fetishizing the black female body were it not for the evils of white supremacy and sexism? Probably not. And yet, she took her power back from that audience by deciding when and how she disrobed. It was on her terms. And she took it a step further by using her body to symbolically confront the evil in her midst. Is that not worthy of admiration? So in the prophet's body, be it Sojourner Truth, the prophet Isaiah, or Jesus Christ, we are forced to confront where the realities of our shared living and God meet and where they don't. It strikes me that some bodies are way more likely to become symbols of fetish, of sacrifice, of vulnerability than others. And not all things of the body that are symbolized are of God. I'm going to say that again because I need you to hear me when I say that. Not all things of the body that are symbolic are of God. I want to ask you today about your body. How's it going in there? Huh. How's the work of inhabiting your body going? 
does your body need more attention? Or perhaps a little less? Because I got toddlers all over my body. I want less attention, (laughs) y'all. Feel me? (laughs) But sometimes at night, I want a little more. You feel me there? Hmm? So it depends on the time of the day, you know. I'm asking you, what does your body need? And does that attention that you don't want or that you do want come from you or outside of you? Is it wanted or enforced? And how do you know? One of the reasons I think certain people's bodies become fetishized symbols more than others is because not all of us are doing the work of inhabiting our own bodies with integrity. It's so much easier to get curious about, to become scrutinizing, jealous of, angered, turned on, or even saved by the symbol of someone else's flesh. But I dare say that is the antithesis of the Christian life. The thesis of the Christian life is incarnation. And by that we mean the revelation of God happens within all of our bodies. Not just a few. All of our bodies. Even yours. Amen.